smoking. Um, you know, the Bible does say that, that some people will get into heaven with the flames licking their hind end, basically. I mean, it says as one escaping the flame. So there are gonna be people that just get into heaven. I mean, they, they were saved just enough. Um, and it's a really interesting verse. I've never actually went in depth in preaching on it, but it says that some will enter heaven as, as though escaping the flames. And uh, who's gonna be the last one? That's what I wanna know. Like, who's gonna be the last human that gets into heaven and everybody's gonna be watching, like, Last one through the door and the flames are gonna come through. Um, nobody from Change Life Church, okay? And that's good. So, all right, hey, we're in the book of Jonah and uh, we are going to do our best to get through chapter two tonight. Um, here's what I believe. I, I am probably a lot more passionate about this study uh, just because of all the great stuff that's in it um, because it's so applicable. I mean, it, it's, it applies so much to my life um, of how, how could God tell a prophet I need you to go preach to this city because they're wicked. And the prophet's like, nope, not doing it. You know, I'm just, I'm, I'm just not doing it, God. I'm not even gonna entertain the thought. I'm gonna run the other direction. And, uh, and we think, how could somebody do that? How could, how could God tell somebody audibly, go this and they go the other direction? But we kind of do that all the time. I mean, what's the last time we maybe felt prompted to help someone or do something or maybe not do something we just went the other direction? I mean, all of us have a story, right? So let's pray, and then uh, we're going to read again the story and then get into uh, where we didn't get to last week. So Father, thanks again for this day. I thank you uh, for this whole story about Jonah. I'm just an emotional guy. Uh, we can all relate to that. We can relate to, to not wanting you to forgive somebody who is so evil, um, and yet your love supersedes that. So I pray tonight that you open up our hearts, and you challenge us, help us to leave changed, and I pray again for just a few phrases to stick in each heart tonight um, as to where we're at, and we love you. Thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's read again through chapter one if you weren't here last week, so you just be caught up. Um, it's easy reading. It says, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. He said, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. And uh, if you weren't here last week, um, further in our notes, uh, the, the Ninevites were very evil. They would attack cities. They would rape the women. They would cut women open that were pregnant. I mean, as they were alive, they would skin people alive. I mean, they were just devastating uh, to these cities around them, people were so scared of them, they knew if the Ninevites were gonna get in, they would just commit mass suicide. I mean, they knew that it was gonna be that bad. And so when, when God tells Jonah, hey, go preach against this city, Jonah's like, they don't deserve it, not going. I mean, they're, they're so wicked, God, I'm not even gonna go tell them that you're gonna destroy them because I really want them to be destroyed. What I think is that Jonah thought, if I can delay, because there's gonna be like a 40-day period um, until God destroys them, I think Jonah's like, I can, I can outlast it 41 days because <laughs> I wanna see him get smoked. Uh, just this terrible attitude. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and he headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa where he found a ship bound for that port, again, after paying a fare. And again, it always costs you to run away from God. He went aboard and he sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. All the sailors were afraid and each cried out to his own God and they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. And again, uh, we're pretty sure it was the Phoenicians who were known for being avid sailors. I mean, they, they just knew the ocean, um, had ships that went a long distance. And so if, if avid sailors are afraid and they understand this is not a normal storm and they're scared, they're starting to throw cargo that they got paid to haul overboard that it's gonna be pretty severe. Um, and there's always a cost to running from God. Okay, not only did Jonah pay the fare, but whoever paid the shipping company to haul that cargo lost everything. Uh, I don't think there was insurance in those days. <laughs> okay, they had to throw everything or lighten the ship and, and so they're gonna lose all the money they get for hauling the, the cargo. The cargo's lost. And uh, Jonah, he was down doing what? He was down sleeping. <laughs> It's going nuts, and he's just down sleeping where he fell into a deep sleep. It says, the captain went to him and said, how can you sleep? Get up and call on your God. Maybe he will take notice of us, and we will not perish. And we looked at last week the uh, kind of types and shadows of Jesus when the storm was raging in his boat. Um, what was he doing? He was sleeping on a cushion, but it wasn't because he was running from God. It was because he knew God had him, okay? And that's where I hope you are tonight, that in the midst of your storm, in the midst of whatever it is that you're facing, that you can sleep at night to say, God, I don't like this storm. I know it's storm. I'm not gonna claim that there's not a storm. There is a storm, but you have me through this, okay? Why? Because you're in the boat that Jesus is in, and when you're in the boat Jesus is in, it's not gonna sink, right? It wasn't Jesus's time, and he was not, it's not like, God would allow him to die in a boat crash. God would be like, well, son, I had you plan to die on a cross, but you drowned instead. God doesn't do that. God's plan is perfect, okay? So amidst the storm, 
Um, Jonah was sleeping, I think, because he just didn't care. Jesus was sleeping because he knew who had him, and that's a cool thing. Um, all right, so he's in a deep sleep. Captain wakes him up. In verse seven, it says, then the sailors said to each other, come, let us cast lots to find out who's responsible for this calamity. And they cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. They just drew straws or something. And so they asked him, tell us who's responsible for making all this trouble for us. Again, they recognized that this was not a normal storm. This was a big storm. Um, and you might be facing that today. You might be facing something in your life that's bigger than normal. Well, run to God in those times. Uh, where, where do you come from? What is your country? What, what people are you from? And he answered, well, I'm a Hebrew and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven who made the sea and the land. And then he dropped that bomb that freaked him out um, because they believed in those gods, the God Poseidon. And you know, so when he, they, he finds that he's running from the God who made the ocean, <laughs> they're, they already know something's causing it. It's, I think they expected something to come up and take their ship says it terrified them and they're like what have you done you know what did you do and then it says they knew he was running from the lord because he had already told them so you ever run into somebody who just is honest like yeah i'm just backslid you know just from running from god i i have occasionally um usually it's when they're inebriated um which is hebrew for drunk um you know and they're honest i'm just running from god and, and it's, there's, it's always misery but Jonah was, was actually had already told them I'm running from God. I'm sure he didn't say I'm running from the God that made the ocean. Uh, it says the sea was getting rougher and rougher. So they asked him, well, what should we do to you to make the sea calm down for us? Pick me up and throw me into the sea, he replied, and it will become calm. I know that it is my fault that this great storm has come upon you. And I had this thought today as I was studying this again, um, is how come Jonah just didn't jump? I mean, why does he want somebody else to solve the problem? Right? It's like, well, you take care of it, Jonah. You, you've already confessed that it's your fault. Why don't you just jump in? And I don't have an answer. I, like, I don't know. Other than we want somebody else to solve our problems. But he's like, well, throw me in and then everything will be fine. But I was just thinking, just jump and they won't have to do nothing. It says, instead, the men did their best to row back to land. But they could not, for the sea grew even wilder than before. Then they cried out to the Lord, oh, Lord, please do not let us die for taking this man's life. Do not let us, do not hold Sorry, do not hold us accountable for killing an innocent man. For you, O Lord, have done as you pleased. And they took Jonah and they threw him overboard and the raging sea grew calm. At this, the men greatly feared the Lord and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows to him. But the Lord provided a great fish to swallow Jonah and Jonah was inside the fish for three days and three nights. Now let's go over, I'm in your notes, page one. Um, and if you just come in, there's some notes floating around. Now, my title of tonight, and there's, there's a lot of things we're talking about, but, but basically the title of what I want it to be is the, the detour is not your destiny. The detour is not your destiny. There are times in our lives, guys, that we feel detoured. It's like, okay, I was going this way and something happened and I, I got detoured. What's the deal? You know, I, I, was, I have a destination to get to. Um, detours to me are never fun because they're time wasters, okay? You have to go around something. Uh, a year or two ago, they out by my house, they were putting a new bridge in that I didn't even know existed by Indian Creek. So you go over Indian Creek and then there's another little bridge. I didn't even know it was a bridge. I thought it was a culvert under the ground. Um, and, and it was like, boy, it must've been three months. I mean, I think it was supposed to be like, a, it's like a six week deal or a four week deal. And I'm thinking no big deal. It took me eight miles. I mean, instead of four miles to the church, it was eight miles. That's how big of a, of a detour it was. And, and I was annoyed most of the time. Okay. And I'm like, well, you guys just work. I think it was a government paid job. So they were just doing like one pebble at a time or something. It was terrible. Um, but I, it, it, uh, detours typically seem to cost you something. Okay. But I still had a destination. I had to get to work. I had to get here. And in a detour, you have to learn to ask for one thing is, is um, did I cause the detour? Something that I, it's a decision I make cause this or is it just life? Okay, but, but detours don't have to be your destiny. I didn't park at the detour sign and just start crying. <laughs> oh God, I'm stopped. I don't, you know, there's a sign that says how to get around it. Um, and Sunday, I'm actually, I'm actually preaching a little bit on that. Um, the title for Sunday's message is I'm getting through it. And I'm excited about that one too, because there's times that we just have to have the attitude of I'm gonna get through this. I'm gonna get through it. Um, you know, pain is always a part of progress. Progress always has a process. You know, we don't like that, okay? We want abs without planks. You know, we want muscles without weights. We just want to look good. Uh, matter of fact, there's a, a young man who had surgery done on his body to make him look muscly. They actually put like rubberized, what ladies do for certain parts of their body, he had put in his arms. I saw a picture of him. He looks ripped, but it's all like 
silicone. <laughs> it's kind of strange. He's like plastic man. You know, would he stretch if he, you know, I don't know. All right. So he looks good, but he's, he's soft. Uh, so let's get into this. All right. So these men were very superstitious, okay? Uh, they had many gods that they believed in, and they found out it was a god who made the sea. It freaked them out uh, because they believed him, and they really believed you. this is a real god, um, and they would eventually become believers. Um, so even in your rebellion, you can make a difference. Isn't that crazy that God can use you, even in your rebellion, like Jonah, to bring somebody else to him? So don't ever think that you're beyond. Now, I'm not saying that's a good way to be a missionary. <laughs> I'm gonna be the rebellion missionary. I'm gonna go out and party at nightclubs and hope that somebody sees Jesus in me. That's probably not gonna work, okay? Bad philosophy. But, but in this whole thing, God used a rebellious person to actually bring people to him. And I believe that those sailors will be in heaven. I mean, or at least some of them, because they're like, we believe in this God who made the craziness in the sea and then he made the calm in the sea and they sacrificed to him. And I think they were changed. And I think we get to talk to him in heaven. It'd be kind of cool. Um, so uh, where are you headed? <laughs> I'm running from God. Terrible, terrible answer, even though he was true. Because running from your problems always solves them, Right? How often do we do that, though? How often do we run from the very thing that we need to face? Running from problems doesn't solve the problem, right? You can run from a bear, okay, but the bear's still there. You know me, I'd rather just shoot the bear, right? If it's gonna be chasing me, because if it's that kind of a bear, now I think bears are cute and I like bears, but if it's an aggressive type bear that's gonna get somebody else, okay, then you need to take the bear out, right? And fishing game will do that. If there's an aggressive animal, they'll do that. Um, and because uh, <laughs> running from your problems always solves them. And I hope tonight that you're not running from a problem that you need to hit head on. Okay? And there's a little story I want to tell you about a horse tied to a workbench. Okay, I have to have these little cues to jog my memory. So one of Lauren's horses uh, several years ago was tied to my workbench, which is outside, has a vice on it. Uh, it's made out of Pretty, pretty, pretty stout, and she had it tied to the vice. Well, the horse freaked; it, could, some, it spooked it. Well, it was the lead rope was connected to my workbench. Well, when the horse jerked, the workbench jerked toward it. Okay, which caused the horse to be completely calm. <laughs> no, it freaked out. Something was coming at it, and the, the more it jerked, the more the bench was coming toward it, and it just started freaking and like ah, we're like, whoa, stop, 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 stop. Um, and here's what I have to say with that is you can't get away from something you're attached to, okay? What is it that you're attached to tonight? What is it that maybe you want to get away from, but there's still an attachment, okay? You have to learn how to sever things. You have to learn how to cut things. And, and this can mean a lot of things to a lot of different people. There might be relationships tonight that are just taking you in the wrong direction. And there's a time, okay? Now, if you're married, different, different scenario. Don't throw them out of the truck tonight. All right, you're married, work through it. But, but if you're dating or there's a relationship that you don't have to, to work out, but they're taking you in the wrong way, you have to learn to detach from it, as hard as that is. But you will go um, with whatever you're attached to. Um, I've been around Christians my whole life, and I will tell you this, that you're either running to God or you're running from God. I've never met somebody who's neutral, okay? Because neutral, you go one way or another, you're either cooling down or you're heating up. Um, and, and I've had people say, well, I'm just sitting on the fence. There, there is no fence. <laughs> you're either in or you're out. You know, the, the fence with, with heaven and hell is an electric fence. <laughs> you can't sit on it, right? You're either in, you're either out. You're either walking toward God or you're going away from God. Um, there's no neutral when it comes to your walk with God. Again, you're getting closer, further away. So there's a time to throw your Jonah overboard. And that's how we ended last week was what is it in your life that you need to throw over, okay? What is it in your life that maybe you're expecting other people to throw over? And maybe that's why this was revealed, because I've read the story a lot of times in all the years of, of being a Christian, and I never really thought about, well, why didn't he just throw himself over? Well, I think he was telling them to. Like, like I need you to deal with me instead of dealing with it himself. I mean, he was honest, but he was like, I want you guys to do it. Was he too chicken? And was like, I, I, I thought about it, but I don't really want to. So why don't you do it for me? Other people can't fix your problems. Other people can't fix your addiction. Can they help you? Sure. And you need people. You can't, if you stay isolated in your addiction, you will stay in your addiction. I really believe that, okay? When, when, when addictions are overcome, it's typically because you've told somebody. And, and so I, I have a, there's a question I ask, or two questions, I guess, I ask myself when I come into certain things, and, and that is this, does God want me to do it or does the devil want me to do it? 
I use this with tithing, okay? If I asked all the Christians, do you think, or do you believe that God wants you to tithe? Who would say yes? We all would, right? Do you believe the devil wants you to tithe? We would be like, no. And then I asked the question, well, then who are you listening to? God or the devil? <laughs> because if we believe God wants us to tithe and we're not, but we believe we should, and if the devil doesn't want us to and we're not, whose will are we actually doing? Let's move on, right? Because that's a little uncomfortable if you're not. Um, but I asked myself this question, Does God, would God want me to do this or would the devil want me to do this? And that's a, that's a really good set of questions to determine, should I be doing this? Um, and so anyway, Jonah somehow doesn't want to deal with the problem himself, even though he admits there's a problem, he's honest, but he's like, I want you to deal with me by throwing me over. And I, again, it, it, it's just one of those things that I caught today that's like, that's, that's kind of a weird thing. Um, but there's a time to throw your Jonah overboard and only you I should say only you. You know what the Jonah is most of the time. What is it that's holding you back? What is it that you know God wants you to do, but you're just not willing to, to completely give everything over to him? And we need to throw that overboard for the sea to be calm. All right. Verse 12, okay? There's a solution to every problem. And what did he say? Pick me up, throw me into the sea, and it will become calm. And he's a prophet. He knows what's going to happen. And then he says, I know it's my fault that this great storm has come upon me. Um, and I wrote down here, I think I posted this today or yesterday, that owning your problem is the first step to solving it. Okay, you have to own it. You have to say, okay, this is my issue. Um, I need to, to work on it. I can't say, well, you bring it out in me. <laughs> if, well, if you bring it out of me, it means it's in me, right? I need to get it out of me because I can't, I can't fix something if I don't own the fact that I have a problem, okay? My problem, you know, most of it is sarcasm. I mean, it's just, I do sarcasm. I'm good at sarcasm. And I practice a lot of sarcasm. And, and I can be really selfish sometimes, okay? I, I can remember the last two times I was selfish. It was like 1980. Um, <laughs> no, I'm selfish every day, okay? If I'm honest, all right? Now, when I was younger, again, this comes from reading God's word and getting older and going, I'm not as good as I think I am. I'm not, I'm not as good of a husband as I want, I want to think I am because I see things through skewed eyes. Um, you know how you find out if you're a good husband? If your wife's smiling most of the time, right? Because if she's not smiling, then there's something that we could get into trouble here. I got to be careful what I say because um, sometimes we don't smile. But you understand what I'm saying. If, if her heart feels, if she feels loved, it means I'm doing what I should be doing. But if I'm causing issues and I'm ca causing waves, I got to deal with that. But I got to own my own problems, um, and that's the first step to solving it. Uh, it's my fault. That's what he said. But admitting it is, is only the first step. Now you need to deal with it because it's easy to say, I got a problem. I got a problem. I got a problem. I got a problem. What are you doing? Like, well, nothing. <laughs> okay. I, most of you know I went ahead had skin cancer, right? I, I, my, my daughter actually found it because I, I, there was something on my head, and I didn't know what it was. Um, and then she did her schooling, she's like, Dad, I think you have skin cancer. And she's like, you need to go get it looked at. So I was like, okay. You know, so finally I did. And they said, yeah, you have squamous cell carcinoma. And I said, okay, so, well, we need to cut it out. I was like, oh, okay, why? What happens if we don't deal with it? Well, they said, well, it gets bigger and grows through your skull into your brain and kills you. Okay, when can we schedule this surgery? Okay, <laughs> It was like, all of a sudden, I knew I had the problem. Now let's deal with it because the consequences were going to be huge. And I'm like, okay, let's do it. And I got a free facelift out of it. Um, so they numbed me up, and then they cut a football-shaped thing around the cancer. And then they, and I, and I said, why is my face getting tight? And they're like, well, we're squeezing your skull to, or your skin together to sew it up. And so I walked out like this. It was like I got Botox, um, but it wasn't. So if you need, if you need a free facelift, just get skin cancer on your head, and they'll fix you up. Uh, but I had to deal with it, and that that required me taking the step to get the appointment and getting it done. Now, I could have skipped the appointment, but I didn't. Why? Because I was afraid, like, this could kill me. It's not just an annoyance. This is severe. And usually the, the bigger the problem, the more you should be apt to, like, okay, let's, let's, let's take care of this. Let's get this fixed. Um, it's like in a relationship. Most of the time, and Pastor Russ and I, we talk about this in marriage. When a woman is done done, she's been done for a while, but when she's done done, you better really change. I mean, you better really go, okay, I need to deal with it. I can't just say, well, I'll change, I'll change, and, and, and mess with it. Because once a woman gets, because women are usually pretty forgiving, but once we push, push it to that point, change really needs to happen in us, okay? And I don't want my wife to ever get to that point to where she's like, I'm done, done. Because when a woman says it twice, you're in trouble. 
right? Not just I'm done, but when I'm done, done, you better, you better do something. I don't want God to ever go, okay, I'm done, done. Because in the Bible, anytime something's repeated, it means like this is really, really serious. All right, so admitting it, um, and I need to talk a little or go a little faster. Now we need to deal with it. Um, let me read this, bottom of page one. Any married couple who both admit, okay, this is huge, huge in a healthy relationship. Any married couple who both admit that they may cause, I'm sorry, that they cause some of the waves have a, has a good chance of surviving. When you both go, I mess this thing up sometimes. I cause waves and I know it and I'm sorry. When you got two people that are willing to be like that and say, yeah, my bad, I'm sorry. You're going to have a good relationship. It, when you have a relationship that only one person says you cause all the waves, that's not going to go very far, okay? We all cause waves. Chris and I have done enough marriage counseling over the 29 years of full-time ministry that we know that everybody is guilty of something. Again, we talked about it last week. Sometimes one is the major causer of it, um, but we all do something, so we all need to grow. When you both take ownership of the marriage, you'll work on it. Um, so here's what we need to say sometimes. Very bottom of page one, this could set you free if you're having a marriage issue. What I'm doing is frustrating you. Okay, this should be in quotes. What I'm doing is frustrating to you, and I'll work on it. Okay, you're acknowledging I'm a frustration to you. I'm going to do what I can to be better. And, and there's times that I, I pray like that to God. God, I know, I know sometimes I frustrate you, and I, I'm trying not to. I'm trying to, be, trying to be better, trying to be obedient. So page two, also, I, um, I've told you often that just because you're facing a storm doesn't mean you've done anything wrong. And a lot of people think that, like, oh, this bad stuff's happening. What did I do? You may have done nothing but obey. Sometimes storms come just because you're doing what's right, okay? But sometimes it does mean that you caused it and that you have to know, okay? Uh, you, can, you can pray. If you have to ask yourself, what did I do? What did I do? You probably didn't do anything. You're probably just doing what God has asked you to do. But Jonah knew what he did. He knew that he'd run. And if you're running from God or you're living in a sin that you're not willing to confess, okay? If you're sitting here tonight or online and there's, there's a sin that you just, you just don't want to give it up, and you're like, I know it's wrong, but I'm just gonna keep doing it. You are going to bring storms on yourself, okay? And the reason God brings the storm is to get you to repent. That's his whole thing because God wants you to have a good life. He doesn't want you to be bound up in sin. That is not God's plan, okay? And like I said, if you're fighting addiction, you're fighting stuff, just keep fighting. God is just proud that you're fighting it. He doesn't expect you to be perfect. He just wants you to fight it. But when we no longer fight it and we're like, I'm just gonna do it anyway, then we have a callous heart. And it's really hard for God to work with a calloused heart. Um, with my granddaughter, she loves Play-Doh, you know, and, and she gets new Play-Doh because after a while it gets hard. Most of the time it gets hard. Why? Because it gets left out. Yeah, leave it open and it gets hard. Um, I don't want my heart to be left out of the Play-Doh can, so to speak, okay? I want it to be kept tight with the lid sealed on and I'm, I'm doing the best I can to love God because when we're in that environment of, of closeness with God and the lid on things, we stay moist and moldable. Okay. It's when we expose ourselves outside of God's plan or outside of his umbrella of protection that we will harden. And I never want my heart to get that way that God can't say something to me um, and me listen. Okay. So we often are the cause of our own storms. Not always, but often. So now is the time of the application part of this message. And again, this is kind of where we ended last week. And what is it that you need to throw overboard? And I added some stuff to this from, to last week's notes. And, and, and I, asked, I added this, why is it hard? Why, why is it hard to throw those things overboard? Uh, my answer, because I'm just a logical thinker, I think, is because we typically like whatever it is that we're holding on to. Like, ladies, how hard is it to throw away clothes that you hate now? That somehow you loved two years ago, but now they're terrible. Um, all right. Ladies, do you ever buy something you thought it was cute and then stuff's changed? Do you hold on to it? Most don't. Most are like, here, I'm going to donate these. Okay. It, it's not hard to give away something that's not important to you or that's not cute anymore. Um, and yet, the things that hold us back, why is this so hard sometimes, okay? And again, it's because we like whatever it is. Now, I put it here in a quote or in parentheses, we may hate the result of it, but we really like it, okay? If you're addicted to pornography, it's because you like it. If you're addicted to alcohol, it's because you like it or you like what it does, right? Because we don't typically have a hard time getting rid of something that has no effect on us. If sin, the Bible says, is fun for a season. It is. If sin was not fun, we would not do it. I mean, sometimes you guys like to fly off the handle. I say you guys because I don't, um, right? We like to fly off the handle. Why? Because it makes us feel good. It's like, ah! And you're like, hey, I feel pretty good. You know, the other person's like, whoa. Road rage feels good to me sometimes. 
the thoughts that go through my brain about spinning people off the road or brandishing a weapon, things that I shouldn't be doing, things that I want to do in my mind, it's like, yeah, you know, it feels good. But we can't do what feels good because usually what feels good in a road rage situation is bad for you. you know, lined you up in prison, right? But that's really the, that's really the my truth is anyway, I, I have a hard time letting it go because I really like it. I secretly, I may not like what it does to me, but I secretly like, uh, we like it. So again, we wrote here, we don't have a problem throwing away something we don't like. So Jonah can represent sin. It can represent uh, rebellion. It can represent fear. Um, it doesn't have to re- represent any type of sin. I mean, I'm sorry, me, me, me I'm talking fast because I have so much. Take a breath. I did have two cups of coffee today because I'm feeling good. Um, yeah, when I had that stomach bug last week, I, did, I don't drink coffee when I feel sick, um, but I'm feeling pretty good now. And I think I had some really potent coffee. Coffee's from Jesus, you know that, right? It's a good, it's a good blessing from God, uh, especially with mothers with children, okay? Um, okay, let me slow down. All right, Jonah can, okay, represent sin. It doesn't have to be sin, but it can represent sin. It can represent rebellion, okay? It rep- represent fear or doubt, or laziness, unforgiveness, uh, past failures, or even successes, okay, addictions, bitterness, excuses, the list goes on. And the more you have on board, the more it hinders your trip. And some of you tonight might be traveling heavy, okay, because you're carrying so much stuff. Some of you are carrying some stuff you're not intended to carry. You're packing other people's problems. You're packing other people's decisions. Um, You know, you might have grown children who are making some bad choices. And and as parents, that that can be hard, okay? Um, And so we can carry a lot of things that God says, you know what? I didn't intend for you to carry that, okay? You know what watching the news does? It can make you carry a lot of burdens that that you can't do anything about, okay? You just, you can't. You can't change it, Um, and, and so there's actually a, a thing, talk, I can't remember, a psychologist, there's a, there's a psychological term for people who look at other people's problems a lot and they actually begin to feel the weight of them. And it's not a healthy thing, okay? Because it's like, you're like over, over caring almost. Um, so again, the more you have on board, the more it hinders your trip. And, and Jesus, if we remember his words, said, my yoke is easy, my burden is super heavy. Now what do he say? My burden is light, Okay. My yoke is easy, my burden is light. Well, if we feel heavy, whose fault is that? It's us, right? We just carry too much. Um, so uh, sometimes, just like the sailors back in verse five, you're throwing the wrong things overboard to fix a problem they're not causing. Let me say it again, it's in your notes. You're throwing the wrong things overboard to fix a problem they're not causing. Or in verse 13, the rowing against a storm God is causing to get you to deal with a problem and that is the root cause. Uh, notice here, it says the harder they rode, the worse, ro- actually rode, right? Rode the boat. The harder they fought, the worse it became. And isn't that like God, that the more you fight what he's doing in your life, the harder it will become. God is doing something in you. And some of you are fighting it. You don't even realize you're fighting it, but it's part of God's plan. And you're going through hard stuff. Um, how do weightlifters, I can ask PJ. PJ, how do weightlifters get strong? By doing what? Giving up? What are they, how do they get strong? Repetition. I hate that word, repetition. My granddaughter is testing me with the repetition thing, and the question is why? Okay, she has become a full automatic. Why ask her? Because now she understands it annoys me. So last night in the garage when she asked me something, and she said, why? I was like, you know why. And then she goes, why, 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 why? She just, just <laughs> look, why, 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 why? I was like, ah! Um, I have security cameras in my garage too, so I couldn't do anything. Um, <laughs> it's like, it's like, don't you? I love her. She's so, she's so much fun. Yeah, yeah. She's just, a, she's a smart, smart little girl. But that is the thing. Why, 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 why? But PJ's right. Repetition, and and putting more weight on. Okay. Again, as a weightlifter, you can tell. Um, <laughs> I wait. I did in high school. Um, I, uh, I. I understood that you have to add weight to get stronger, okay? And, and muscle has to break down, okay? Somebody who really knows what I'm talking about could tell you that, but there's gotta be tearing of muscle for it to be built up. Some of you are in the tearing process right now, and you're like, God, what's up with this? And God says, just keep going. I'm, I'm doing something in you. 
And too often we walk out of God's gym and we're like, it's too hard. Well, if, if you don't, if you don't keep going, you can't get stronger, okay? And that's why I'm encouraging you tonight that if you're facing something, you just have to say, okay, God, you're doing something to me that I can't see and I don't even understand, but you're a good God and you, and you love me as your child and you want the best for me. So I have to believe that what I'm going through, even though I may not like it, even though I may have caused it, I'm just gonna ask that you would grow me through it. Just do something in my life. Help me to, to, you, to use whatever I'm facing to help somebody else. Yeah, that's what the attitude God wants, okay? And the Bible does say that he won't let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. So he's kind of like the a spotter that you can't see. And when it gets too heavy, he'll, he'll pull it off you, okay? And, and if not, if he doesn't pull it off you and you die, you get to go to heaven. That don't sound too bad, right? So it's kind of a, a win-win thing. All right. Um, but I want you to think about that. Are you throwing wrong things overboard to fix a problem they're not causing? We, we do that quite often. Okay. Okay. Um, so the storm was a symptom of the cause. The cause was disobedience. Um, down page two, uh, the storm was actually God's mercy. I want you to think about this. The storm was actually God's mercy. It was getting his attention and, and giving him a chance to do right, getting Jonah's attention, giving him a chance to do what's right because God could have smoked him and got someone else to do it, right? I mean, God could have did that. God could have said, yeah, Jonah, <laughs> I'm done with you. But the storm was actually mercy. So what we face at times in life, when things get hard, it might be God just going, hey, I'm being merciful here, okay? It's, it's gonna be uncomfortable, but it's uncomfortable because I want you to get better. I want you to learn to obey. I want you to learn to do what it is that I've asked you to do. Um, and all too often, at least with me, I focus on the symptoms instead of the problem. And so I wrote here, bottom of page two, is you can fight it or you can fix it. You can fight it or you can fix it. You can be like the guys that are rolling, we're gonna, we're gonna make it, we're gonna make it. And God's going, I ain't gonna let you make it. Okay. And the storm got worse as if it wasn't bad already. I mean, they're already freaked out and it gets worse. And they're just, they're trying to save Jonah's life. They got good hearts. They don't want to throw the guy overboard. They want him to die. Um, and they fought and fought and fought. And God says, the harder you fight, the harder it's going to get. It's like a kid, you know, the kid that won't cry when you spank. Okay. Because I, I believe spanking should bring tears. Right. And again, I'm not talking about abuse. I'm talking about a good looking out of the Old Testament. Um, a good discipline, because that's what I had to have. I mean, it's, if a spank, it didn't hurt, what's the point, right? It, it, the Bible even says it won't kill him. It'll save him from hell. And, you know, you, you can have whatever view you want on that, but I'm going to stick with what Proverbs says. Um, and, and all my kids today are serving Jesus, and none, neither, none of them backslid. All three of my kids have never just turned their back on God. Now, that's not always because I know very godly people who had kids backslid. For me, I'm very blessed that my kids just decided not to. And uh, um, I got, you know, great parents that parented us well. And uh, so I don't want God to have to discipline me more. There was a point with my kids when, when all you had to do was show them the spanking stick and they were like, okay, cool, we know, we're, we're good. Uh, there was a point where I had, we just like the spoon, you know, wooden spoon that Chris would keep it. Um, she carried concealed carry in her purse. It was a wooden spoon. And I said, I want you to do this, all right? And so all she would have to do if the kids start freaking out at the checkout line, which is normally where they do it because they put all the candy there, all she'd have to do was just, just flash it and the kid be like, cool, we're cool, we're good. Mom's packing. She's packing heat and she'll use it too. When we get to the car, she will use it. Uh, and it. And it worked well. Now, if you haven't disciplined your kids like that and they're 15, <laughs> don't start, right? Or even 12 is, I got spanked at 12 years old. Um, but my parents were consistent with that discipline. So I knew that when they said, don't do it, if I did it, I was going to get a licking. And, and I think, really believe that God's like that. And that's why he gives us his word. And he's like, if you obey, then you won't get a whooping. But if you disobey, I'm going to cause some storms in your life. Um, and again, some storms are not the, they're because you obeyed, not because you did something wrong. But we're talking about Jonah. So we're talking about storms from disobedience. Um, so you can fight it or you can fix it. Uh, disobedience, again, was the cause here as it usually is. All right, I wrote a story here, chicken casserole to the dogs. Uh, when I was probably 12 years old, uh, my mom made this big old thing of chicken casserole. That was like one of our favorite dishes. And uh, so my dad loved it, and we fed our scraps to the dogs. Well, my mom said, hey, throw the scraps to the dogs. So I took the pan of scraps and threw it to the dogs and helped her clean up the kitchen. And a while later, my dad said, hey, where's the chicken casserole at? And my mom's like, well, it should be in the kitchen. Da, da, da. And, and 
it was a bowl of scraps in the kitchen. <laughs> I threw the wrong stuff away. I threw the good stuff away to the dogs. The dogs had good meal that night. They're like, we like you. Uh, and, and my dad wasn't too happy <laughs> about that. Complete honest accident. He didn't flip out, but I could tell he wasn't very happy. Basically, he was saying, pay attention next time. Um, and, uh, you know, completely innocent mistake. And my dad is an amazing forgiver. Um, but sometimes we toss out the wrong bowl. Okay, we throw the wrong things out that, that aren't causing the problem. Um, I wrote down here, obviously I'm not going to name anybody, but I've seen husbands and wives, page three, throw their spouse overboard when the problem was an addiction or simply unmet expectations because the expectations were too high. I had one point, one case years and years and years ago, um, you wouldn't know anybody, that I thought the wife was the problem really did. And then there was a discovery that there was severe addictions on the man's side. And I was devastated when I found out because I believed the guy. I mean, good. I mean, you just smooth, you know, and I was like, geez, what? this is crazy. And, and then I found out the truth and I was devastated. And I was like, well, I didn't like chastise the girl, but I just didn't believe her, you know, because the, the, the guy was, because even Russell tell you this, that addict, the addicts are liars, you know, we're addicted to anything, we lie about it. And, and he would just lie and paint a whole, whole different picture. Um, so even I got fooled after years of marriage counseling, and now I realize you're all lying. <laughs> now, uh, um, yeah, I have to, I'm very more, I'm much a lot more careful because it taught me something, that, that you can't have the wool pulled over your eyes, right? Um, and that was a really sad thing. But, I, but, but basically, she got thrown overboard when he had the issues, you know, and that's why I, I put that down. Um, an example, ladies, you might think, well, my husband isn't romantic as the guy in the movie. <laughs> He's not either, okay? Um, the wife doesn't look like the supermodel. You ever seen a supermodel without makeup? <laughs> she don't look like a supermodel, right? <laughs> uh, they don't, okay? Um, it's not realistic, that's right. It might be something you're trying to fight on your own, okay? And you haven't really allowed God to help you. Um, you can't win it on your own. I've also seen people expect God to do all the work and take the problem away without them doing anything. Okay? I've, I've seen it, pretty much all of it. Uh, people are like, okay, well, as soon as God takes this addiction from me, then I'll quit. I, I, that doesn't happen very often. I, I saw one guy who got uh, delivered from cigarettes, had cigarette smokes for years. He went to a men's retreat, and God, man, I prayed for him, and he was delivered, boom. Okay, It was, it was amazing. He was like, no didn't even want them anymore and never smoked um, after that. But that's few and far between. God doesn't usually just take your addiction away. He wants to know, um, are you going to do your part? So you might blame other people for your actions to things, okay, if blame shifting is your MO. Um, if your actions are hurting others, okay, hear me on this. You need to own it and stop it if you want healthy relationships. You just, you have, to, you just have to, okay? Okay. Um, if you're on the receiving end of others' bad decisions or behavior, set some boundaries. Set some boundaries. If, if you're, and we'll, we'll say in a marriage or your kids, um, I can't control you, but I can control of how I'm going to respond to you. Okay, I can't control your craziness, but when you act crazy, here's how I'm going to respond and set the rules. Okay, if you've got a husband that's acting crazy, ladies, you can say, hey, you know what? You can, you can disrespect me. You can do it all you want, but you know what? You ain't getting any sugar. I'm not talking about the kind in the cupboard, okay? There, there's, a, there's a boundary to say, if you act this way, then you're not, this is how I'm going to respond. I'm not going to respond in a loving manner, okay? I'll give you a handshake and a peck on the cheek for bedtime, and that's all you're getting until you can learn to, to be nice to me, okay? And husband's the same way. You, I can't can control her, but you can say, okay, here's how I'm going to respond to it, okay? You know what bothers me. I'm not going to be mad at you, but here's how I'm going to respond to it. Okay, and there's a biblical way to do that. Um, so um, with your kids, the same way. I can't always control your kids. You have a little more control, but when you act this way, this is how I'm going to respond to it. Okay, and you, see, you can say it with a smile. I'm not mad at you, but this is what's going to happen. You throw a fit, this is, you're not going to get any sugar after, not like real sugar, like ice cream or whatever. Um, all right, I'm going to take your phone away. And I'm going to do it with a smile. If you, you know, if you have a junior high girl or boy and they're being disrespectful and they have a phone, you can say, hey, the next time you do that, I get your phone. Say it with a smile. This is going to be fun. This is a game. I get to take your phone from you. Actually, actually it's actually my phone anyway because you, you're holding my phone. You realize that, teenagers, right? Um, so there's certain ways you can do that, that you can act like Jesus, but you can still set a boundary to go, this is how it's going to be. 
Think about this. You don't disown them. They're still your child. They're still your spouse. God does this to us. God doesn't kick us off his family, but what he does say is if you act this way, I can't bless you, okay? If you're gonna, if you're gonna behave like this, there's certain things that I'm just not gonna do in your life. Um, you know, so there, there's ways to do it. Well, God is, again, showing Jonah, <laughs> you're, you're done wrong, and here's where we're gonna go with this. Um, you're gonna go the other direction. Jonah was an emotional guy, and I wrote that down because we can relate to him. Again, he's a prophet of God, He's a man who hears God's voice. He's a man who I believe wants to do what's right, but he's a man who's very bitter. Hear me. He's very bitter towards somebody because he doesn't believe the Ninevites deserve salvation. He doesn't believe that. How do we apply this? There might be somebody in your life that you're bitter toward. You don't think they deserve forgiveness. Oh, you know, God might forgive them, but I can't. And, and it's not that you can't, it's that you won't. And I know it might be hard, And I know they may have done some horrible things to you, things that you have to work through. And I've never gone through that type of thing, but I know a lot of people who have. And I've known people who have made it to say, you know what? They made a decision to hurt me when maybe when I was younger, but I'm not gonna live there anymore. I'm not gonna live in that captivity and I have to give it over to Jesus every day. But you need to know that there's freedom from that. If you've been abused or you've been, whatever that's happened to you, there's freedom from it. There really is. And... You know, God is, is too big to not help you through that. And he can take what you have gone through to help other people, okay? So we, we don't, don't let somebody else's decision or decision you made when you were younger make you think, well, God can't use me now. Absolutely, he can use you. If he can use Paul, okay, who was doing crazy stuff, he can use us. And so Jonah is just this emotional guy. I don't, I don't, want, to forg- I don't want you to forgive him. And then it, toward the end of the story, he's like, I knew you, I knew it. <laughs> I knew if I preached him, you were gonna forgive him. I knew, ah. I'm like, Tony, you're a psycho. Like, you're an evangelist. You should be, you know, you should be bragging. You know, 600,000 people just got saved at my, you know. Uh, but he didn't, he's mad. He's still mad. It's a funny story toward the end because God allows some things to happen and, it just, it's just a, Jonah's just this emotional basket case. And a lot of us can relate to that, right? At least certain parts of, of our life. Uh, but here's why I wrote it. Jo- Jonah was an emotional guy, but God, it, got, it gives us hope because God's servants weren't perfect either, okay? And I wrote this. Some of you need to hear this. Perfection doesn't qualify you. Willingness does, okay? You don't have to be perfect. God doesn't expect perfection. He just expects effort. So God has patience with the bad decision to run away. And let's get one thing straight here, that God would rather you do things right the first time. <laughs> That's really God's plan. It's like, do it right the first time, we won't have to redo it. I don't know how many times I've been fixing engines or whatever, and, and I got one thing ahead of something else, and I had to take a bunch of stuff apart. Or you ever put like a crib together? Guys, when we're new dads, we're like, I look at the picture and I can do it. <laughs> and you put in all the things, and you, that one little screw that was supposed to go in that one little place that holds the entire thing together, Am I the only one that did that? Um, and you're like, oh, that's what that was for. And you got to dismantle half of it to get that one little screw in that one spot so that it locks everything. I've done that before. But God would rather us do things right the first time. So if we haven't, we begin to teach our kids, okay, to say, hey, I've made some bad decisions, but I don't want you to have some of the regrets and scars that I have. Um, we, we teach our grandkids that, okay? It's our job to do that. But we often don't do things right the first time. Okay, and that's what the cross is all about. What God say? He said, go, preach to Nineveh. Again, if you weren't here last week, it's in Mosul, okay, Iraq. Mosul is, is where Nineveh was at. Jonah hated the Ninevites so much, he would rather die than see them repent. He'd rather be thrown overboard because he didn't go, oh, there's a fish, you know, throw me overboard, fish are gonna swallow me up. He was a prophet, but I don't think he knew that much. I think he thought he was gonna die and dying is easier than going seeing people saved. That's, that's the whole thing. He was willing to die, okay, <laughs> then see Ninevite, the Ninevites come to the Lord. Well, Jesus was the opposite. Jesus had to die for us to come to him, okay? So there's a lot of little parallel things here. Um, there's a lot of hatred, okay? And this, this might mean something to you. There's a lot of hatred in Jonah for some reason. They were evil. Again, they, they did, they raped, they cut pregnant women open. Um, you can read that, you can skin people alive. But let me tell you something about hatred in page four, top of page four. Hatred will turn you into a bitter person and cause you to do things that you never thought you would do. That's what bitterness does. It turns into hatred, and hatred will make you do things or cause you to do things that you never thought 
Okay, how many of us have, have ended up places we thought, I never thought I would end up here, right? Never, right? That's most of us. It's like, I, I didn't think that little decision would lead down this path. And all of a sudden, there's a path and there's the consequence. Because uh, Satan doesn't, doesn't show you where it's going to end up. The devil does not want to show you the end of your road. Because it's a road of destruction if you're living in sin. Um, I don't even think the devil wants you to see the blessings that God will give you for doing what's right. He's just a liar. He just lies about everything. Um, we won't talk about any um, political things that I want to talk about, but I'm not. Um, any particular debates that may have happened that was complete truth, all of it. Um, let's keep going. <laughs> you know, I really want to talk, but I'm not going to. Um, all right. Yeah, I will not indulge you. You can go watch it. All right. He'd rather have, uh, or much rather have God smoke them than save them. And here's what I got out of this is we all have a little Jonah in us, a little self-righteousness that wants to be the judge instead of an understanding jury that looks at our own sin before judging the sin of others. See, I'd be a lot more forgiving if I had to hand you a list of my sins or temptations before judging yours. Right? In other words, if I'm, if I'm with you and I got to deal with your sin and I'm not happy about your sin, but I have to hand you a list of my thoughts for the last week or my actions or whatever stuff you don't know about, I wouldn't be very quick to judge you. Okay? If you could read through my list and go, oh, oh, you, you did all this. Well, now let's talk about yours. I'd be like, yeah, never mind. Let's just, we're good. Okay? I'll just forgive you. We'll just move on. Yeah, we're, we're fine. Um, it's always easier to point out how you annoy me instead of asking how I annoy you. Okay? A good marriage sometimes will say, hey, how do I annoy you? I mean, I, I ask that Chris sometimes. Sometimes I don't have to ask him, then I just know. And it's, it's usually my, my fun personality, the thing that she was so attracted to before we got married. Because my sarcasm was funny before I got married. She loved my quick wit and my humor. She loved it. Right, babe? And she, 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 I know you did. You did. I'm telling you, you did. You don't remember that you did, but you did. Um, I, have, I have letters from her that says that yeah, just your sarcasm is great. You're so funny. I, don't know. I have a lot of letters. I haven't read them. Um, we do. We have actually all the letters that we wrote to each other. No, um, but there are times that it's good to do a check with your relationship to go, hey, where am I at? How am I doing? Am I doing things that bothers you? You know, things that may I not see. That's a healthy, that's a healthy relationship. So um, the detour, again, is not your destiny, but I added this, but it can lead there. Okay, it can lead there. The detour is not your destiny, but it can lead there. Some detours... Um, is God showing you the scenery of where you'll end up if you stay on this path? And that's what was going on with Jonah. Is he's about to get thrown overboard and, and eaten by a fish. God's going to show him a little bit of stuff. Like, if this is what you want, I mean, you're rebelling. I can show you what rebellion looks like. And it's not fun. It's dark. There's seaweed. There's acid that he's going to, there's stench that he's going to experience. Um, so God is going to say, hey, there's a detour here. And, and if you keep rebelling against me, here's where it leads. God doesn't want to make your life miserable to get your attention, but he will if he needs to. Okay? He will. I, same way as parenting. He'll let you keep going down until you're ready to get up. He loves you too much just to let you do your own things without giving you an opportunity to change your ways. He won't make you, but he will give you an opportunity to change. Okay? Good parenting consists of encouragement and consequences. That's what it is. You, you encourage your kids, but then there's consequences when they disobey you. All right, verse 17. It says, but the Lord provided a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was inside the fish three days and three nights. And that's a long time, being inside of anything for three days and three nights. Again, we're not going to talk about what the fish was. You know, it could have been a whale shark. It could have been a gigantic goldfish that God made just specifically for this instance. We have no idea, and there is no reason to argue or speculate about it. I mean, there's people that get into huge debates over what it was, and they're like, so what? Is it big, what's the Bible say? Big fish, all right? Big fish, whale shark, easily. Think about this, this, we'll call it a great fish, that the great fish was probably born somewhere, okay, and went through an entire life of eating whatever it was that it was eating that happened to be right in the same exact place that the ship was, it was going nuts. And see how God's timing is always perfect? And, and the fish is there, and the fish is probably not even thinking, I wish I could eat a human. <laughs> Maybe that boat will throw somebody over. I don't, it, it was probably eating plankton. You know, I don't think it had teeth. Um, I just don't know. What I do know is it was big enough, and it was available. 
to swallow a guy who was rebellion and thought he was going to die. I don't believe that God said, hey, I'm going get to get a big fish and you're going to be in the fish. Jonah and I thought, this is it, man. I'd rather die than do what God wants me to do. And the fish swallowed. So Jonah, bottom of page four, didn't see the fish coming. All right? He thought it was over. Okay, listen to me. Nothing is ever over until God says it's over. You might feel cast out. You might feel cast off a ship. You might feel like, I don't want to get cast off the ship, but I am a cast off. Some of you, because you're serving Jesus, you're cast away from your family. I know people that have gotten saved and their family just said, you know what, we're not nothing to do with you. And you're like, oh, you liked me when I was strung out and doing stupid stuff. <laughs> you liked me when I was an addict. You liked me when I was an alcoholic and now you're kicking me out. Um, I, I grew up with a family. Yeah, where's the entertainment? <laughs> yeah, where's the entertainment? <laughs> uh, um, that's what pastors are for, right? Um, I, I grew up with a family and the husband was an alcoholic, like raging alcoholic great worker, worked for my dad, worked in the woods with him, and nice. I mean, he was nice to us, never never saw him be mean, um, but when he got drunk, he was mean. I mean, he's, it was, again, I grew up on the reservation, and um, and he was American Indian, and just loved their family, but when he got drunk, he, he could get very mean toward his family. Now, I never saw him mean, but with his wife, he would get very violent, and so there was a lot of abuse that happened. I mean, we knew it. She, she came to our church. Um, he would never come to church. And finally, after years and years of putting up with it, putting up with it, he got saved, came to our church, gave his heart to Jesus, like quit drinking. I mean, he got legit saved. She divorced him like a year later. What? Yeah, and as a teenager, I'm like, what the heck just happened? Okay, somehow his alcoholism, I don't know why she stayed, I don't know if she, whatever it was, but he gets saved and she divorces him. All these years of saying, you need to change, you need to change, and then he changes, and she's like, well, I didn't want you to change. I, and I can't say, you know, if you're a psychologist, you may be able to tell me what it is that happened in her, but she just is like, I'm done. That's crazy. So you might get rejected for, for living for Jesus. You might. You might get thrown overboard. Let me tell you, when you get thrown overboard, it doesn't mean it's over. And that's, maybe tonight you feel like I'm drowning in this. I don't know what life is. I feel like I got thrown over the, God will always provide a vehicle for you to get you where he needs you to go. And that's where we're shifting in this whole story is this fish shows up, okay, appointed by God. Timing is always perfect. God provided this fish and Jonah has to do some thinking. Okay, so let's read this. Jonah didn't see the fish coming. Again, he thought it was over. It's not over till God says it's over. Jonah did do something dumb. He ran from God, but you can't change your past choices, okay? It happened. Go to page five, but this is important for you. There's no changing the choice, but now you have an opportunity to change directions. You can't change your past. You can't change what has done. Uh, sometimes you can't undo, you know, there's certain things that Russell says, you can't unring that bell, <laughs> okay? Once the bell's rung, it's wrong. It, you can't go unring it. But you can change directions, and that's the beauty of the cross is God knows the choices you make, and he knows you went down into the dark. Can't change the choice, but now you have the opportunity to change directions. So um, I wrote here, you took the devil's detour. Now it's time to find the on-ramp back onto God's highway because the detour is not your destiny. As a Christian, you have to believe that. So Jonah chapter 2, <laughs> here he is in the stomach of the fish. Let's read about it. Um, well, actually, let me read what I wrote first. So here he is in a stomach of a big fish, dark, stinky, dinners of the, I mean, contents of the fish's dinner all over him. Uh, death would have been easier, okay? He's probably just like, I wish I'd have just did what God said the first time. You ever been there? <laughs> I just wish I'd have did what God said the first time. I, I had many times like that with my, my parents <laughs> after a good spanking. <laughs> I just wish I would have did what God, what dad told me to do. Um, so today... You might be in a place that you'd rather not be in, and I really hope this means something to, to some of you. You might be in a place that you'd rather not be in, just like Jonah, either by your own choices or by someone else's choices. Either way, you're there, and Jonah does what we often do in distress when we get serious about our prayer life. See, prayer should be an everyday, throughout the day thing, not just in 911 situations, which Jonah is now a part of the 911 situation. So here's what he says. From inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord God. And he said, in my distress, I dialed 911. <laughs> I called to the Lord. And he answered me. From the depths of the grave, I called for help. And you listened to my cry. You hurled me <laughs> into the, I love that guy. Under, uh, that's underlined in my Bible. Hurled, because he's about to get hurled <laughs> again. Uh, you, you hurled me onto the deep and into the very heart of the seas. And the currents swirled about me. 
All your waves and breakers swept over me, and I said, I have been banished from your sight. Yet I will look again toward your holy temple. So think about this. He, I don't know if it was nighttime, daytime, whatever it was. He gets thrown into the water. I don't believe that he sees this fish get him. I think all of a sudden the fish opens his mouth, sucks him in, and he's just like, this is bad. Because Jonah's the author here. And he's writing about his experience of, this isn't right. I should be dead. Maybe I am dead. If I am dead, why do I feel it moving? How come, I, how come there's fish in here? How come there's seaweed? How come, how come there's... Why is there octopuses in here? I mean, he, he probably has all these ideas and he's got to do everything through feel. You know, in the movies, there's always this little blue light. You ever notice that in the dark? I'm like, where's the blue light coming from? Um, but he's in complete just darkness and there's water and seaweed because he goes on to think and he's got to be confused. Like I was just in the water. Now I'm in this really weird holding thing that's stomach is gurgling and there's bad smells. Um, so he starts praying. And, and then I said, I've been banished from your sight, yet I will look again toward your holy temple. Maybe he thought, I'm going to die, so I'm going to see the temple of God. The engulfing waters threatened me. The deep surrounded me. This, this may be what some of you feel like tonight with life. Okay, seaweed was wrapped around my head. To the roots of the mountains, I sank down. The earth beneath barred me forever. And I love this. But you brought my life up from the pit, O Lord my God. When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord, and my prayers rose to you, to your holy temple. Those who cling to worthless idols forfeit the grace that could be theirs. But I, with a song of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you. In other words, I think he said, God, if you get me out of this, (laughs) then I'll do what's right. What I have vowed, I will make good. Salvation comes from the Lord. And the Lord commanded the fish, and the fish vomited Jonah onto dry land. Okay, think about that. He vomited Jonah onto what? Dry land. So did this fish go up to dry land and just like completely, how many of y'all got the bug this last couple months or so? Anybody? I mean, like, and you had, it was like projectile, right? I don't want to be gross, but it was not just, oh, I just got to vomit. For me, it was violent, okay? Uh, And I'm a violent, I shouldn't even tell you, I'm a violent vomiter. Um, Like once a year, I get that sick and it's like, it sounds like I'm dying. Um, And I will go when I know, (laughs) The things I talk about in church, I will go like sanitize the toilet and everything, like spray it all down, get it all clean, and I'm just like, this is going to be violent. Uh, And and this fish, (laughs) too much information, like, ew. Uh, All right. At least I'm connecting with the crowd, though, because y'all can understand. All right. I could go, go, I'm a man of God. I never throw up. (laughs) Right? No. Um, and, And this fish vomits him onto dry land. He doesn't even get a bath. Okay, I'm thinking grace would have been vomit you in like three feet of water where you at least can wash up a little bit, but he just vomits him onto the sand. So here you got this guy who's been nastiness all over him. His, his hair is probably gone because of that and he gets into the sand. So he's like, what are those candies, brown candies with, they roll them. Amaroka, yes, thank you. Um, I was gonna use a different example from the cat box, but I thought that'd be gross because I've already used my grossness for tonight. Um, <laughs> But but now he's rolling in the sand and he's got slimy stuff all. So he looks like a giant almond roca. I like. Let's keep it at that. Um, <laughs> and and again, he's white, pigmented. They, it's just, he's just weird looking, right? Like an alien almond roca. Um, I really wanted to go the other direction, but I, I can't. Um, and so I, I just think God's humor is funny, right? It's he doesn't even get a bath on the way. I'm sure he went in and washed up. At least I hope. So let's talk about this. I got, and then Pastor John's going to lead some songs. Um, okay, verses one through 10, in middle of page five. Okay, three days and three nights. <laughs> and all you can come up with is a 10 verse prayer. Uh, maybe he was just quiet for two and a half days. Like, what is going on? This is, this is crazy, but he had to think about some things. And I think it's what he thought. My decision got me to this place. Now I need to get serious about my walk with God. And that may be somebody that's listening tonight is I've made some decisions. Okay, I got to own it now because if I want life to get better, I got to change. I got to make some changes. And, and change is a slow process. I, I always tell people that, that it took you a long time to get into trouble and it can take you a long time to get out of trouble. Okay, well, you can say, well, I made one bad decision. I got trouble. No, you were making a bunch of little ones before that, right? Nobody starts out breaking into banks, Nobody starts out stealing a car. Usually it's a Tootsie Roll or something little. It's always progressive. And so the belly of the fish, here, I'm just reading read you my thoughts here. The belly of the fish was miserable. But God used this miserable situation to get Jonah to the place that he needed him to be. You can whine and complain, or you can choose to say, God, 
I don't like this. And this is maybe the prayer you need to pray tonight. God, I don't like this. But being as I'm gonna go through it anyway, I have to believe you're doing something good with it. And there are times that God will use what you don't like to get you where you need to be. This was one of my posts from today because I usually will post like what I'm gonna preach on. God will use what you don't like to get you where you need to be. I want you to think about this because I added this with, with pen later on in my notes. This was a dark place for Jonah, but I want you to think about the whale. The whale was still heading in the right direction. So life might be dark for you right now. You may not understand what's going on. You may not have any sense of direction, but the whale is moving toward the place that God has for you. Isn't that a cool thought? Like the whale's going in the right direction. Jonah's like, ah, and that may be you today going, ah, and God says, wait, I got I, it's okay, you're in a vehicle, whatever vehicle yours looks like, I'm taking you in the right direction. The well knew where to go. In the darkness, God will still take you in the right direction. Uh, page six, what I know about God is this, is that God uses what works, not what's comfortable. He will use what works on you, not what's comfortable. And if you, you keep choosing to go the opposite direction of what God wants for you, you will be uncomfortable a lot. But the detour does not have to be your destiny. I think my grandma had a, my grandpa had a paddle growing up. He, he, he was a woodworker, so he made one out of plywood. It's like this big. Um, and it had a leather thing, and it hung right where we could see it all the time. And I think my grandma might have had one that had a soft heart cushion on it. It was like a handle with a heart cushion. Or somebody, one of my relatives had one. It was like a little pillow. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it didn't do nothing. I was like, there's a picture here, right? Um, I don't want the plywood. I want the pillow. Sometimes God has to use the plywood. Other times he uses the pillow just to get your attention. He doesn't always use what's comfortable. So if you keep choosing to go in the opposite direction of what God wants for you, you will be uncomfortable again a lot. Okay, but again, the detour does not have to be your destiny. Verse six is important. He says this, Jonah says, you brought my life up from the pit. And I wanna point out here that you should never forget what God brought you out of. Never forget where you came from. Don't live in the past, but never forget what God brought you out of because when we forget, we become unthankful. We become unthankful. It's, it's like, I want to remember every morning that Jesus died for me, gave me a second chance, okay? To wake up in the morning and say, God, thank you for the second chance you gave me. Help me to be the one that offers second chances to others when they sin, when they blow it, to be forgiving. See, when you live every day knowing that you deserved hell, but got heaven, you'll keep things in perspective. Not everything is gonna go right, that's okay. Even in Jonah's current circumstance, he chooses to remember the good things that God has done in his life. Even in the middle of paying for his bad decisions, he realizes this, that what you hold on to can hinder you. And somebody needs to hear that tonight, okay? What you hold on to can hinder you. So what do you need to let go of? I'm just gonna read the rest of my thoughts here. If anything, being in the belly of a fish gave him some perspective at this point in his life. I think God provides things that are uncomfortable for us uh, to get us perspective about what's really important in life. We get comfortable, I'm sorry, we get comfortable really fast. Um, traveling across the desert, like when I go through Nevada, I think about the pioneers and how uncomfortable it must have been for them, but they endured it because they had hopes of a better life. Third world countries, which I've been to a couple, there's often hopelessness. They do not see that there is any way that life can get better, and because of their corruption in the government, they really can't. Okay, there's just a hopelessness that they have, but God gives us hope. So the call of God is never revoked in your life. It never expires <laughs> like a Harbor Freight coupon does. <laughs> I've gotten to Harbor Freight before. I'm like, hey, here's my 20. They're like, ah, it's over. It's because they make it so tiny, I can't see it anymore. Um, all right, so I check them now. You might think God is done with you because of a bad decision. I will tell you as your pastor, as your friend, he is not. He is not done with you. Okay. You might be in the fish, but you're going in the right direction. Just keep going in the right direction. Page seven, because Rich, we are gonna get through this tonight, my friend. Just like Google Maps, you may get redirected when you miss your turn, but he's still got a plan and a purpose that he needs you to fulfill. And that's why you need to not give up tonight. That's why you need to endure the belly of the well experience and believe that God's gonna bring you through it if you would just hold on, because hear me, giving up won't get you anywhere good. Okay, remember I told you your feelings will fail you and what you feel about it doesn't matter near as much as what God's word says about it. And God says, I will never leave you or forsake you. Okay, you'll get discouraged if you let your feelings fly the plane. 
You have to trust the facts of God's word and believe that if you just keep doing the right things, right things are going to start happening because what you plan is what will grow. Again, the detour is not your destiny. Okay, with the cross, God gives us a second chance today, just like Jonah and the Ninevites. And if God can give a brutal people a second chance, he'll give you one. Amen. He'll give you one. Jesus, thanks for what you did, Lord. And and right now, we're just going to turn our hearts to worship you through song. And as Pastor John leads us, I pray for your anointing to come into this room. Father, if those are in this place tonight, they're just feeling like, okay, I've blown it. How can God use me? I hope that tonight spoke to them, God, that, that you're never done when we're not done, and that you will keep us even in the darkest times, even our own decisions like Jonah, that you could still use us if we're just willing to go. And so we just I pray again, Holy Spirit, fill this place with your presence. And we love you and thank you for that. Amen. Let's go ahead and stand up. Pastor John, will lead us. Would you stand as we sing it tonight? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord? Almighty, who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord? Come on, he's coming on the clouds. started with just in faith all of our lives tonight friends who can stop him the Lord Almighty who can stop the Lord Almighty that's it who can stop the Lord Almighty no one who can stop the Lord Almighty who can stop the Lord Friends, he's the line of Judah say. Cause our God is the lion, the lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. And every knee will bow before him. Cause our God is the lamb, the lamb that was slain. For the sins of the world, his
His blood breaks the chains that every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. And every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Come on, friends, let's just make this place right where we're sitting, standing singing an altar today. Lord, we bow at your feet. We you let your holy name be praised. Yeah, are you hurting and broken within? Or overwhelmed by the weight of your sin? Jesus is calling. Yes, he is. And have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Yes, Lord, we come to your altar. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness, it was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Yes, Lord Jesus, tonight I'm leaving behind my regrets and my mistakes. Say, leave behind your regrets and mistakes. There come the day there's no reason to wait. Jesus is calling. Sorrows and trade them for joy. And from the ashes, a new life is born. Jesus is calling. times with these words we're about to sing. Oh, what a Savior. Isn't he a wonder? Jesus, thank you for your wondrous grace that doesn't make sense to me, but I'm so grateful for.
Lord Jesus, we'll lay it on to your feet. Come on. And bear your cross as you wait for the crown. And tell the world of the treasure you found. Come on, friends, it's our final prayer. Let's just close our eyes and sing it to him. Oh, what? And oh, what a Savior is Jesus. It isn't he one. Sing hallelujah, Christ is risen. We bow before you, Jesus. We bow down before you, before he is Lord of all. Sing hallelujah, Christ is risen. Yes, Lord. We believe it today that you're risen in our lives. Thank you for your wonderful, matchless name. Would you go with us in this place with your grace and your mercy? In your name, as people said, amen, amen. Thanks for coming tonight, friends, and for singing. We'll see you Sunday, 9.30 or 11.